That worked. All right, well, hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, April 3rd, 2015. I guess this is a holiday for us in Canada. Is a holiday for you guys in the States, too? I don't think it's an official holiday. I mean, yeah. many people observe it, but I don't think it's right. a, a federal holiday. Yeah, it's a federal holiday for Canada, and we don't take the Monday off. So, anyway. Um, well, cool. So, <clears throat> as you saw, joining me this week, we've got uh, David Dickinson. Hey, David. Uh-oh. We can't hear you, David. What did you do? And while he fixes that, we got Morgan Redberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. <clears throat> Uh-oh, David. What happened? Oh, I heard of that. All right. How about now? Yep. That's it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I switched to my backup mic here on my laptop, so we'll see if I can muddle through with that. So <clears throat> this week we are going to be talking about uh, the Planetary Society's long-range plans, uh, a new navigation satellite launched by India, uh, the Long March rocket from China. Uh, we're going to talk about Ceres and the shortest eclipse of the century that's about to happen. Now, of course, this is a live broadcast, so if you want to join us, all you have to do is um, click on, while you're watching this on YouTube, there's a banner at the bottom that says that we're interacting with the community. Click that, and then you can uh, use the Q&A app, and you can actually ask your questions, and we will uh, try to answer them. And uh, I think we'll <clears throat> have lots of time for questions today, so... Um, and I want to just sort of do a quick shout out before we move any further, and that is, uh, this is actually my second hangout for the day. We just did a cool hangout with the folks from New Horizons and NASA to talk about updates on the, on the mission. So you can uh, find that. We've got a story on Universe Today, and if you want to watch the video of that, it was, it was just great. An hour long of me getting to ask all my geeky questions with, uh, you know, Alan's, Dr. Alan Stern and the rest of the team from... South uh, West Research Institute, as well as uh, James Green, the uh, the director of planetary science for NASA. So it was a really good time. So I highly recommend you give that a shot. Um, okay, cool. So let's get on. So I think the big news is that we're going to have a lunar eclipse. David. Yeah, there there is a lunar eclipse coming right up tomorrow morning of this this Easter weekend. Uh, if you're in the Pacific region, you're going to see the entire bit of totality. If you're east of the Mississippi, like I am here, you're only going to see a partial phase. Actually, here in the state of Maine, I am in the only state in the Union right now that's not even going to see a partial eclipse. We're going to see a penumbral, which is like the lamest of all eclipses. So. Fortunately, it's cloudy here, so I don't have to feel guilty about it. I'll probably just be watching it live. I know Slu is going to be streaming it live. Um, the virtual telescope, uh, Gianluca Mafi is going to be streaming it live, uh, so I'll probably be supporting that tomorrow and watching that. It's going to be occurring very early in the morning, 12 universal time, about noon universal time, is when totality kicks off, and totality is the shortest totality for the 21st century. It's, it's uh, four minutes and some change long, which is the shortest one. I, I did some research on this. It's the shortest one from the 16th century all the way out to the next century. I, in the blog post that I wrote on the Soros, and the one I wrote for Send this week, actually, I have the years in it. They're not on the top of my head right now, but I know it is the shortest uh, totality for this century right now. And this is part of a tetrad of four eclipses where we had two last year, and we have two this year. And it's kind of cool that North America gets to see all four of these eclipses. So we've, uh, lunar eclipses are becoming commonplace right now. Every six months or so, we're having a lunar eclipse. We're going to have another one in September. And unlike a solar eclipse, a lunar eclipse, you only have to be on the hemisphere facing the moon to see it. So you don't have to journey to a narrow path of totality like you do for a solar eclipse. And you don't need to Something. use any special protection to, to watch it. <laughs> I, you'd be surprised how much I get that question about is, is it dangerous to watch a total lunar eclipse? It's like, no, as a matter of fact, you need no, yeah. you don't need a telescope, you don't need binoculars, you just go out and look. If you can see the moon, just look at the moon and you'll you'll see it. You'll it see it it's as less it dangerous in. than a full moon. <laughs> it is actually. It's much dimmer. When you're doing photography, that's a, it's always tricky when you're photographing a lunar eclipse because uh, the moon gets stopped down so quickly that you find that you're changing your exposure settings from like uh, a five hundredth of a second down to about if it's a dark totality, which I don't expect this one to be because it's so it's just barely going inside Earth's shadow. Uh, 
I find my exposure settings down to like four or five seconds long to get a good image of totality. And incidentally, this one happening happening at sunrise, I fully expect we're going to see a lot of, uh, you're going to have a chance to get the full moon, the eclipse moon behind a lot of landscape, like mountains, trees, buildings, statues. There's going to be a lot of interesting... People standing on ridge lines, making, oh, holding, holding the moon, the moon yeah. making oh, yeah. shapes. Yeah. I, I see new stuff every eclipse where I'm like, I didn't think of that. I, it, it, as many eclipses, and I've seen lots and lots of total lunar eclipses, and just the photography, every time somebody amazes me with something. And speaking of which, there is something I've never seen before that might be able to be captured from the southwest of the United States. It's a transit of the International Space Station in front of the eclipse moon. I have a video up on YouTube right now that shows the maps and the paths. Uh, the path passes near a lot of cities, actually. Uh, Las Vegas, Flagstaff, Phoenix, Tucson. It kind of runs right down. And I know there's a lot of people, because I used to live in Arizona, I know there's a lot of people that are going to be watching this eclipse. Unfortunately, it's not during totality, but it's going to be really close. The moon's going to be up 75% eclipse. So I expect tomorrow to probably see some photos of, I know we've seen photos of the uh, eclipse sun with the ISS passing in front of it. I've never seen anybody catch the ISS passing in front of the moon during a lunar eclipse. I wonder if Terry so, uh, Legault is going to take a crack at it. I, you know, we, we need to have a webcam on his house or something just to know when to like, keep track of where, Yeah, where, where is he? Where, yeah, he's of course... Yeah, the, he, he may be in Arizona. He may be in yeah, Arizona. Yeah, right I wouldn't put it past him. He, if you don't know Terry Lego, he is the guy who who takes these amazing uh, images of, of the space station and this, you know, back in the day, the space shuttle transiting in front of things. So he would take pictures. He yeah. would go to very specific places on Earth to to make everything line up he, perfectly. He caught one from Spain this last solar eclipse, and that's the second one. He caught one, I believe it was from Oman back in 2002, I believe it was. He also yeah, he did one, one from Australia one time, too. Probably the most amazing one, and I think it was him, was he caught the shuttle either post or pre-docking with the ISS, and, and he caught both of them transiting the sun at the same time. Yeah. I was like, that is, because I've, I've seen, I've managed to catch the ISS transiting the sun and moon. I've never, uh, and I've seen when the shuttle was flying, I've managed to catch them both as a pair flying over. But to catch them that close together, you really, it, it takes some amazing planning and timing to find where to go on Earth and get that. Because when you see an ISS transit in front of the sun or moon, it's quick. Yeah. It's really, it's less than a second. Yeah, he's a, he's you a think monster. of how fast it moves over the sky. So, yeah, it's really so let's give people just some <clears throat> some specifics. If they're watching this right now uh, and you want to see the eclipse tonight, what time will it start? Uh, totality is right around it's right around 12 universal time, so i got to do some conversion in my head. That's 8 o'clock Eastern Standard, how, or Eastern Daylight Saving. However, the sun will have set, or the moon will have set from here. So from, say, the West Coast, taking seven hours off, 5 a.m. in the morning, because uh, everybody's on daylight saving time. We've just shifted over. 5 a.m. will be right when totality. So about an hour prior to that, you'll start seeing the moon getting a bite taken out of it at that point. If you're west of the Mississippi, like I said, you'll see the entire thing. So, so more early, early, early Saturday like six, morning. 6 a.m., 7 a.m.? Right around, right around the uh, 5 a.m. Yeah, for he's in, you're in West Coast? I'm in Colorado. Okay, so you're mountain time. Yeah. So, yeah, it's going to be an hour ahead. So you're going to see it right around just before moonset, sunrise, right around 6 a.m. mountain daylight saving time to do all the conversions in that way. So, yeah, and it's only about four minutes long, but the eclipse itself is going to last. The partial phases are going to last a couple hours. So. Awesome. Okay, so... Um... If, if you have cloudy skies like me, then you'll have to watch it on, online. And as you said, there's a bunch of places that are going to do a live broadcast. So I'm sure we, we'll have lots of places. We, we ran the weather, too, uh, and looked at what the National Weather Service had for cloud cover. And the western U.S. looks pretty clear. It looks like the area west of the Mississippi is going to be, as of 24 hours out, pretty clear. You don't Not need a here. perfectly clear sky. Oh, it's cloudy there? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. totally socked in. Yeah. <clears throat> I can't imagine it's going to clear up. The cool thing about a lunar eclipse is you don't need a, a, a clear sky horizon to horizon. You just need a clear view of the moon to see it. So even yeah. a, a sucker hole through clouds will do. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, well, let's move on. So, Morgan, you uh, you had an interesting story this week about the Planetary Society and their 
their ideas about when we can put send people to Mars. Yeah, so we've been thinking now for a while. Some people would say since 1970. Others would say more recently than that, that Mars is going to be the next place uh, in the solar system that we want uh, to send humans to visit. But the real question is not if we're going to go there, but when we're going to go there and how we're going to go there. People have put forth a whole variety of different uh, plans suggesting timelines and costs and capabilities to achieve this. And the latest to do that was the Planetary Society, which is a well-known uh, planetary science advocacy organization um, here in the United States. And they lobby for things like the Mars rovers and for continuing Cassini and, and other planetary science-related activities. And they've decided to expand their horizons uh, to include uh, humans uh, out in in space. And so to sort of kick off this initiative, they got together a group of 70 experts from various fields relating to um, space exploration and human space flight and public outreach and basic science and all of these things to come to some sort of consensus about what the most realistic way for the U.S. to get to Mars is within NASA's current budgetary structure. And that's key because we know we could get to Mars relatively quickly if we had sort of Apollo program kind of money to throw at it. But that's not going to happen. Uh, NASA's budget is projected to stay flat for the foreseeable future. Some people would say that would be a great outcome. Uh, others think perhaps uh, their budget will even decline relative to the overall size of the federal budget uh, in the coming years. And so fitting it within that framework is going to be key. And they suggest that we do this not by attempting to land the first time uh, that we send humans to Mars, but to sort of follow the path that Apollo trailblazed and send people to Mars, have them orbit for a while, come back to Earth, learn some lessons, and then send another crew once we have that part down um, that can actually go down and touch down on the surface. And they think that if um, NASA sort of jumps on the ball here and proceeds with a reasonable but not an extreme pace, that they'll be able to get a launch off for Mars orbit by the year 2033 which is 18 years from today. And then within the next uh, seven years, before 2040, they'd be able to follow that up with uh, a landing onto the surface. So do you, how, how do they feel about the, the plans for going to various asteroids and asteroid, you know, moving asteroids and sending humans to, to asteroids as well as sort of the, the moon? Are they, are they thinking that Mars should be just the only plan or, or should this all be part of a you know, multi-stage process of going into space. What they announced this week was sort of just a line of the overall plan, and they haven't made clear yet how they see this exactly fitting in the overall um, plan, the overall schedule that NASA has, but they did make one thing clear, which is they see this work towards going to Mars taking the place of future space station operations. The uh, U.S. has agreed to operate the International Space Station with Russia uh, through the year 2024, and after that, Russia has said they're going to pull out. And NASA's claim that if Russia pulls out, that it will be untenable for them to maintain the ISS on their own. And the Planetary Society says, okay, let's go with that and take the money that we were spending on the ISS and spend it on going to Mars. And they say, if we do that, then we can fit this in with NASA's existing budget. There's not a budgetary uh, space to have both a space station and a program to put Mars uh, on a rapid track in the current uh, economic climate uh, here in the United States, but we can pick one or the other. Now, how this fits in with the uh, asteroid retrieval mission, which is the plan to go send a robot to an asteroid, bring a piece back, put it in orbit about the moon, and then send asteroids or send astronauts out to study that in the 2020s, uh, isn't clear. I, uh, I asked Casey Dreyer about this yesterday, and he didn't have any concrete information about how they saw um, this mission fitting in with the asteroid retrieval mission. But they plan to release a much fuller report later on this year that presumably will flesh out a lot of those details. Yeah, and Casey Dreyer, uh, who is, who's appeared on the Weekly Space Hangout in the past, has, has just been doing a great job of lobbying <clears throat> Congress, lobbying at the Hill, and being able to really help get more 
emphasis placed on the various NASA programs. And so I think it's, you know, someone who really has his uh, ear to the ground on this, it would definitely be Casey. So that's good. I mean, 2033, that's to have humans orbiting Mars. I would be all right with that. 2033, I'm going to be collecting Social Security. So it's kind of depressing in a way. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting plan. Uh, and it is, of course, just sort of a proposal at this point. Uh, now that it's out there, people can start talking about it. Once they have the full plan put together, uh, and they did have a lot of experts in the room for these discussions, both scientists and engineers, uh, policy people, etc. Once that's fleshed out, then it'll become something that they can start directly lobbying NASA for. Uh, and once or if they get buy-in from administrators in NASA, that's when we can start to see it enter uh, the appropriations process and become something that NASA works towards. Uh, but 18 years is a long time, and that's 18 years just if everything goes as planned. We're talking about turning over the political environment in the U.S. a number of times uh, between now when we basically have to decide to do this and the actual launch. And that's what has sort of bedeviled all of the other uh, plans to put humans farther out in space from the ISS in the past is that we get going in a direction and then we decide, well, it's not happening fast enough, let's change our, our mind and go somewhere else, or it's too expensive, or uh, it's too risky, or, or what have you. And so the real key and where the Planetary Society maybe can play the biggest role here is in figuring out how to shepherd this project along for the long haul. Because we're going to need 20, 25 years of buy-in from the American public, from the uh, elected representatives of uh, the United States, as well as administrators and other appointed officials at um, at NASA, and that's going to be no small feat to undertake. So Chris Marshall says, um, <clears throat> "I'm not a fan of the Planetary Society plan. First, it assumes that there would not be a space station after 2024. That would be a step backwards. Plus, it seems like a very long way to travel just to orbit. We can do most of that locally already." So, so what do you think? I mean, one, uh, how do you feel about the assumption that the space station is going to be gone by 2024? Well, I think that the return that we wanted to get from the space station never really materialized. Uh, we've learned a lot of valuable lessons in understanding long-duration space flight in uh, the ISS. Uh, presumably, we could also learn those whilst going to Mars, but the scientific... Um, bounty that we got from research on the ISS never amounted to uh, the hundred billion dollars that we've invested in it. So I think keeping the ISS alive just for the sake of having it or a similar space station is not uh, the most compelling way to go. But I, I do agree, and I talked about this a little bit in my story this, this week, that there's questions to be raised about sending astronauts to Mars simply to orbit and come home because going to Mars is going to be substantially more dangerous for astronauts than going to the moon. And I alluded to the fact that we sent Apollo 8, Apollo 9, Apollo 10 to the moon. They went and they orbited, they practiced, they came back to the Earth. That took a couple of weeks. They were safely ensconced inside of our magnetic field for the entire time. A trip to Mars is likely to be eight months in one direction. And then you spend, you know, hopefully some substantial amount of time in orbit, you turn around and you come back. We're talking about years in deep space away from the radiation protection offered by our magnetic field. We're asking astronauts to put themselves at a very high risk. Uh, and we have to be sure that we're going to learn things from that orbit. Just because we can get to Mars to orbit first doesn't mean we should if it's not a valuable thing to do. Uh, they said sort of passingly that there'd be great scientific opportunities here. Uh, I don't buy that. I think that sounds a lot like the claimed scientific opportunities for the asteroid retrieval mission. Uh, there are things that robots could do probably better, certainly more uh, cheaply. Uh, so we need some concrete reasons that orbiting Mars with humans will help us more efficiently make the step to landing on the surface. Well, uh, otherwise, it's... Uh, it's a lot of risk to take for, you know, somewhat questionable gain, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, this strategy actually came up earlier, and if you go back and watch the New Horizons hangout that we did earlier, and we had sort of a similar question come up, which is why it's sort of a bummer that New Horizons is going to do a flyby of Pluto. Wouldn't it be amazing if it could go into orbit? And uh, and James Green, the 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 director of planetary science for, for NASA, sorry, uh, said that, 
that this is this is what you do. You take incremental steps. The first thing you do is you send a flyby. Then you go into orbit. Then you send a lander. Then you rove, and then you bring you try to bring a sample back. Yeah. And you take each one of these steps because each one is incrementally more difficult than the last. Actually, getting astronauts to Mars and back is technologically feasible, but there are going to be a million things that are going to go wrong just in that process about their breathing, about their propulsion system, about radiation protection, about um, uh, food, the kind of calories they're going to need, about personal interactions. All that stuff is about sending humans from Earth for a long period of time and, and taking them away, as you say, away from the protection of the Earth's magnetic field and then seeing how what goes wrong. And then you fix that for next time. With the next time being, now you have to add the additional complications of how are you going to try and actually land something on the planet? How do you get them back up into orbit again? So so I, I do think that although it's sort of emotionally saddening to not actually land people on the surface of the, of the planet, the science, I, I, the science you learn, it's not science exactly, it's you learn how to explore, you learn what goes wrong, you learn, you know, that you've got to take lemons to prevent the scurvy, you know, in the, to use an analogy back in the, in the old days of sailing. And so I, I think that it is better than not going. And if, and if everyone's going to be too afraid to do the whole mission, to go, to land, to return samples, back, you know, that's that's going right to the end. So sure. I'm I'm actually super on board with, with this being a mission. Yeah. It's a plausible plan as long as we're going to orbit for the right reasons and learning how to survive in space and learning how to perform the tasks needed to get to Mars and then thrive in Martian orbit before we get there, those are the right reasons. Going to orbit first because we can do it faster is not the right reason. And so the plan when they release it later this year is going to need to show that they're going to orbit as a way to ex expedite going to the surface. Um, if we go just simply to say, hey, we're at Mars 10 years sooner than we otherwise would have been, that's not the reason to go. Uh, and I think that I think they understand that, and I think the plan that they'll put forward is going to say, well, here are the specific things that we need to master before we can attempt to land, and that's what the orbit will allow us to do. There, there have been plans to go to Phobos first. I've heard of crew missions to, to land uh, a crew on Phobos before we go to Mars, which would be much easier to do. For sure, for sure. But again, it's the yeah. <clears throat> you know it's the same thing. You have to get to do that. You have to get to Mars, and then you have to be able to actually yeah. get to Phobos, land on Phobos, return from Phobos, and as we saw, even yeah, we, Rosetta, we would still learn a lot of those skills. Yeah, and and so we can learn those skills separately by going to an asteroid that's relatively nearby the Earth and try to land on it. You know, those kinds of skills will be practiced in another place. So anyway, I mean, if I was uh, in charge, I I would probably sign off on that plan, personally. I, after I'd already signed off on go to an asteroid, go to a bunch of other stuff, as, and, and I agree that to say that there is any scientific purpose for this stuff at all is to, is to really do exploration a disservice. So here, is, here we are, kind of part of the problem again, because we've got this shiny new plan in front of us, and we're all on board to, to take it, and doing that means redirecting ourselves once again. We're no longer going to do the asteroid retrieval mission, something we'd committed ourselves to do. Now we're going to go to um, to Mars by 2033. And, you know, if that happens, that means, you know, the asteroid retrieval mission survived like five years uh, in our current environment. We need a mission to Mars to survive five times that long. Uh, it, you know, when do we decide enough's enough, we're going to stick with the plan that we have? Uh, and I think that's the soul searching that NASA administration has to do is ask, okay, maybe this Mars 3033 plan is better, but do we lose more by never actually getting anything because we keep changing yeah, direction? Should totally. we go to ARM, do ARM right, learn things from it, even if it's not optimal, and then go to Mars after that, having accomplished something, even if it means it takes a little bit longer to get to Mars. And that's the big question that uh, Administrator Bolden uh, and others are going to have to be able to answer. Yeah, and I, you know, let me let me propose a mission parameter, which is that you make a big checklist of all the things that you don't know how to do, put them in the order of what's the easiest thing to learn how to do, and then you come up with missions that do those one after the other. 
And that's, well, that's how it. we got to the moon. Is we that's had Mercury, how we, got to the moon. we had Gemini, we had Apollo. They learned to get to space. They learned to work in space, and then finally they learned to go to the moon. Uh, and it was a lot of rapid, small cadence. Yeah, uh, exactly. Missions. And that's what it is going to have to be. Yeah, More. and that's ex and, and that's precisely it. And there, and if we can see that continue, like someone should just pick up Apollo and just continue on. And I'm sure they even have. I'll bet you that list exists somewhere. <laughs> Of all the things they wanted to do after Apollo, and someone that was the plan that. after Apollo was to oh, continue yeah. right onto the to Mars. Yeah, and the funding, so someone funding got cut. Up there, yeah, there was a the plan. Going. There was a plan, I believe, 1970-72, to do a Venus flyby using Apollo hardware. They were actually going to do like uh, a Skylab type uh, spacecraft and do a Venus flyby. There was plans to do that. So yeah, they dreamed big back then. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's move on. Uh, I'm, you know, this won't be the first time we'll argue about this, uh, especially with a special guest who's going to come in a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, so uh, let's talk about uh, series. Yeah, it's uh, well Dawn spacecraft is orbiting series right now, and there's been a lot of discussion. How come there hasn't been new photographs of series? Because the Dawn spacecraft is doing a long, long looping orbit right now through the, the shadow. Remember the last photos we saw about a week or so ago was of a crescent series, which I thought was really cool because you never see an asteroid at that phase like that from Earth. So uh, the Dawn spacecraft is orbiting back around, but in a few weeks we're going to start getting views of Ceres again from Dawn. We're going to actually begin the science phase of the mission, which is going to be very cool. And I thought it was kind of cool to pull the trigger on a post I've been thinking about a lot for a while of actually observing Ceres from your backyard and where it is right now in the constellation Sagittarius, where it's kind of looping through the constellation uh, Capricornus right now, uh, and actually try to view this, because it's about 8th magnitude. Incidentally, it's not far from the nova that went off in Sagittarius either. It's about maybe 10 degrees from it uh, in the morning sky. But as it reaches opposition this July, it's getting better and better to actually see Ceres. I've seen Ceres. I've seen Vesta. I've seen Pallas. These types of asteroids, they're binocular asteroids. Ceres was actually discovered on the first day of the 19th century. It was discovered on January 1st, 1801. And I think it's amazing that we're just now getting a look at it. It's been nothing but a little star-like dot in our telescopes for over two centuries. It was finally getting a look at Ceres, and it's finally turning into a world on its own. And when I started researching this, I noticed some things on uh, the Wikipedia entry that were not quite accurate. Uh, talking about transits of objects from Ceres that you would see in the inner solar system. So I started running some simulations and it sent me down a really interesting rabbit hole of uh, what type of planetary, because you know from Earth we see Mercury and Venus, we saw Venus transit the Sun in 2012. Ceres from the asteroid belt, you could see Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars transit at different times. So I started running some simulations. And as I suspected, there were a lot of transits of Mercury. There's one of Mars in 2033. This is if you were sitting on Ceres looking like at the sun from there. Curiously, I did not find any of Earth. I found three of Venus, but I ran out the simulations for about a millennia. I did not see any of Earth. And once you go with, uh, with uh, planetarium type simulations past about a thousand years or so, they, you know, other little gravitational anomalies start to mount up and they're not really all that accurate for simulating things. So I didn't go up past 3000 AD. But I, I just thought it was kind of bizarre that, uh, and I was hoping to find something I could actually simulate to show this. Mars was the, was the oddest one I could find to simulate on the little YouTube video that I did from Starry Night. But it's, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, footprints on Ceres one day and be able to actually see these kind of astronomical events from different perspectives. You're a maniac, I gotta say. Oh, this is the kind of this is the kind of stuff I do for fun. I know, I, I know, I know. It's, it's hilarious. The some oh. of the stuff I get to, you know, your some of the stuff that you're working on, and you you'll email me and go, I'm I'm simulating this, man. You yeah. are, yeah. Some of the occultations that you found, things like that. It's good, yeah. Yeah, people. It's and, good to and know to me, you. This is this is real research stuff that I'm like, hey, no one's ever actually. It could be the case when you're looking at these things and you wonder, it's like, well, what would an eclipse of the sun look like from one of Jupiter's moons? It's like you may be looking at something no one's ever really looked at before, and, and uh, you, you might find something interesting. So, it's kind of neat. Uh, so when are we going to get better better views of Ceres? When are we going to start to just and maybe get that 
that question answered, what is that white spot on, on Sirius? What is the white spot, yes. Uh, we're seeing right around April 15th or so when I was researching, uh, looking at uh, the Planetary Society and, and the, the Dawn website for NASA. It looks like about April 15th we're going to start getting uh, some new uh, really good science images of Sirius. And, you know, there's, there's other questions, too, that are out there, like, I think it'd be neat if we found a moon around Sirius, even a tiny one. You know, that's, it's not out of uh, their own possibility that those kind of things could be out there still. So, well, it has one now. It has, yeah, it has Dawn. It has Dawn. And, and incidentally, that is Dawn's final resting place. Dawn is not leaving Sirius orbit. Once it, it orbited Vesta and it became the first spacecraft to go from one body orbiting uh, and going into orbit around another body beyond the Earth's moon system, of course, but we've orbited the Earth and the moon separately. But. I wonder if what they're going to do at the end of the life for Dawn, because with, uh, I don't know if you know, Morgan, because with Cassini, they're going to crash into Saturn, what they did with Galileo, because they don't want to potentially influence a potentially habitable sort of uh, some of the water. And there may very well be water ice on, on Sirius. Yeah, I think the plan on is just Sirius. to leave it in, in orbit uh, without any sort of atmosphere. There won't be any degradation of the orbit. And I think the belief is, is that yeah. uh, Sirius will have a close encounter with another asteroid so far in the future that the spacecraft is safely uh, stationary, basically, with respect to Sirius uh, for as far forward as we can project. Right, okay. Yeah, so it's safe. Yeah. Maybe um, we'll be able to retrieve it one day. <laughs> uh, so you got some a couple of spacecraft launch updates, Morgan. Well, yeah, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight was that India just launched its fourth uh, navigational satellite. Uh, for those of us living in the United States, uh, and maybe in Canada as well, we don't really think about the fact that GPS, uh, the global positioning system, is not the only uh, gl navigation system out there um, in um, in the world. Uh, the European Union has their own regional system called Galileo. Uh, Russia has a regional system, as does <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as does China and India. And that kind of reminds us the sort of strategic importance of these um, systems, that we like them because they tell us how to get to the library or where the closest Starbucks is. Uh, they were originally conceived to be uh, military assets and companies or countries are, are uncomfortable with the fact that the United States and specifically the Department of Defense controls the global positioning system uh, and maintains it uh, first and foremost for the use of the US military and so we're seeing more and more countries opt to launch their own uh, network of satellites none of them cover uh, the entire world like GPS does they're focused on regional conflicts like an uh, around China or around India or a conflict uh, involving Russia, uh, but it shows that that they're thinking about the various uses of these satellites, and we can't just take for granted necessarily that we'll always have uh, this system available for us uh, in the form that it is today. Right. Yeah, um, they're finding if you want to be a superpower, you have to have your own GPS constellation, basically. Firstly, uh, uh, and this is not part of the story, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, government is exploring what happens when war starts, and the first thing that, that a country does is shut down all your GPS satellites. Uh, yeah. And so we, we, we gain this great strategic asset of being able to position ourselves around the world, but the question has now become, well, in a serious conflict, those would either be destroyed or jammed. How do we uh, still position ourselves as accurately uh, using assets that don't have to be as vulnerable as GPS satellites, which are basically sitting ducks in space? And so it's it's one of those things. You build a great weapon, somebody else builds a great defense, and it's going back and forth. Uh, and it, it's driving a lot of technology development along the way. We're satellite, I know we've, we're totally uh, going down a rabbit hole here now, but I mean, satellite. The Russians just recently tested a satellite-killing uh, rocket. I think it was just a couple of years ago. Yeah, they did. They done a test, and I think there was like a there was a re-entry into the atmosphere, and people thought it was like a big meteor, and it turned out it was probably a, a Russian uh, satellite-killing. The Chinese have done the same. Uh, and the Chinese have the done Chinese, the same thing. The Chinese never did the same, do it, in, but. Uh, it's not yeah. wouldn't be surprising if they had at least attempted uh, that sort of thing, even if they didn't follow yeah. through because of the debris created. Um, and when yeah. you look at, like, for example, when the Soyuz and the Dragon launched to dock with the International Space Station, 
you know, they do it very slowly. You don't have to just quickly zap and destroy this this satellite. You can just send something up, tweak your your altitude, slowly change your orbit, get close enough, explode. Yeah. And and you can take out that you can take out that satellite. Or, you know, jam it. Lock, this this grab goes back all sort of to the dawn of Space Age. Because one of the reasons the space shuttle was built the way it was, the large payload was under the assumption that sometime in the future the US may wish to kidnap a Soviet satellite, put it in the space shuttle, bring it back to Earth, uh, and study it without having to have destroyed it. And so that was a major design requirement uh, for the space shuttle and uh, not Surprisingly, the, the Russian version of the space shuttle, which never actually ended up flying, uh, was built in a similar way. Uh, and so as long as we've had satellites, we've been thinking about uh, how do we deal with them and what life might be like if suddenly they would disappear. There, there's been some talk this week, too, that the Chinese launch may have put up their, uh, their own, you know, the X-37 that we have. Uh, they have a satellite deployer that is similar that they're working on fielding that they may have put it up in orbit along with the... Uh, constellation of GPS satellites to deploy them this time. Well, so, and the X-37 is going up next month. Again. Do we even know what the X-37 does, though? No, nobody does. It works for the U.S. It's, it's uh, Air Force, so it's either, it's probably testing some new technologies up there. But, uh, but it's yeah, got a payload bay, right? I mean, it's the kind of thing that could yeah, serve sure. that same function that the it could go up and you think, snatch you think satellites. I, I, ideally, with that, it's interchangeable, so you can put different payloads up there for different missions, and that's just uh, speculation. But that's probably that would be the the obvious use of a, a mini space plane like that to do, to just change right, out but, whatever cameras you want to put up there. Right, but I guess the thing is, is like, what is the difference between launching a rocket and putting something into space? And a space plane, like I, it's it's that it comes back safely yeah. to Earth, right? That's what it does. That's different. And so you're gonna want to do something. You're gonna want to take something from the ground, take it to space, do something in space, and then return safely to the ground with whatever it is that you took. And I mean, it, the X-37 is is unmanned, but you know. It was it was noted uh, when the X-37 was up last time that when hostilities, because there's amateurs that are following these things all the time and following their orbits and seeing what they're doing. When uh, hostilities started in Syria, the X-37 did an orbital adjustment right around the same time. So uh, it, it, it looks like they were using it in some kind of uh, reconnaissance surveillance capability. Again, this is all speculation that you know of, of amateurs that are following these things, but it's, it's interesting to track these things. Now, we talked briefly about the Chinese, so why don't we talk a bit about uh, their Long March 7 rocket, Morgan? Right, so they're developing a, a new series of rockets uh, to replace their, their existing ones that are going to be sort of more modern, up-to-date rockets. Uh, not unlike the process that NASA and the United Launch Alliance is undertaking to modernize the American fleet of rockets. And So they have three rockets under development right now, uh, somewhat confusingly named Long March 5, the heaviest, uh, Long March 6, the the lightest, and Long March 7, the most medium of, uh, of the rockets. Uh, and they sort of announced this week that they're behind schedule uh, with the Long March 7. It was supposed to launch uh, pretty soon. It's been delayed now for uh, at least a year, I, I think. Uh, also, they announced that they are on track with the Long March 5, which is going to be similar in, in lifting capability to uh, the Delta IV Heavy uh, employed by NASA for launching things like Orion. Uh, and the Long March 7 will be more similar to something like the Atlas V, which is the workhorse of uh, both the civilian and uh, military launches done um, in the Western world. Um, and so, it, really, I put the story in here just to point out that it isn't just NASA that can get behind schedule. Uh, developing things for space is challenging. And even if you have uh, unlimited resources uh, and the workforce that you want, things don't go as you plan, and you have to adjust to that. And so the fact that things work as frequently as they do is sort of the most amazing fact in all of astronomy, uh, that most of the time things work as they're supposed to most of the time. And and we overlook that a lot, I think, and, uh, and, and we shouldn't. And China's going to solve these problems, and they're going to have a reliable uh, launch vehicle that will allow them to build out their own space station uh, in the future, as well as hopefully collaborate on more international um, collaborations and uh, scientific explorations. 
All right, so you know the. Uh, Oh, go ahead. The, uh, the, I was just going to say real quick, the, the Tiangong-1 space station the Chinese put up there, uh, it's still up there. They said they were going to deorbit it after the two crews that went there in 2013, but, you know, the set trackers are still following it. And it is interesting to know. I don't know if they have any other plans for it or they just haven't got around to deorbiting it or if there's a classified component to the mission or anything like that. But it's of note that they, they still have their space station up there, too. Wasn't it destroyed in the movie Gravity? <laughs> it wasn't gravity, yeah, but it, well, it, it was in the same orbit as the Hubble and the International Space Station. So right, very easy to get right to. next door, apparently. So. Um, okay, so let's move on now. Uh, so, as you may know, uh, this broadcast is made uh, possible by a wonderful community on Google Plus known as the WSH Crew, and there's about 350 people there who are absolute, dedicated, die-hard space fans and act as sort of the producers of this show. They recommend stories that we should cover, and they're even lining up guests that we're going to be bringing on the show. And uh, just an, I, Nancy Graziano has been doing a lot of work on that. And uh, Nancy, can I say the name of the guests who are in the, uh, uh, in the upcoming schedule? I would love to sort of give people an advance uh, notice on that. So if you could just post in the chat, that would be cool. Um, uh, but if you want to join the WSH crew, just go to Google+, Plus, do a search for WSH crew, Weekly Space Hangout crew, and uh, like I said, a really great community there. Um, and they suggest a bunch more stories above and beyond the ones that, that, that we've brought to the table, and this is where we're going to get, we put, uh, we put this us uh, on our toes to see how well we've been paying attention to all the stuff that's going on in the, uh, over the course of the, so of the well week. This week. Not so well this week. So first, I'm going to add one here, which this one came from Jim Meeker, uh, which is Curiosity Scars on Mars Change Over Time. And this is a, a pretty quick post that was done by NASA. I don't know if you, if either of you guys, I don't know, have you seen that image, no, Morgan? No, I haven't seen it. No? Okay. So this was great. NASA put out a, an image of this. And so since Curiosity landed on, on Mars, you know, the retro rockets fired and then it oh, uh, it landed. Yeah. And so yeah. the the NAS the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has been taking pictures every year of the landing site and you can actually see the damage oh, cool. if you call it repairing over time. And so, you know, the yeah. scorch marks have, have started to disappear and it's just gonna be a couple of years before the scorch marks are completely gone from the surface of, of Mars. Yeah, remind you uh, what an active world Mars is in comparison to yeah. the moon or Mercury or even a lot of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn that we often like to talk about. Uh, Mars is a living, breathing world, even if nothing is alive on it. Uh, and the climate reshapes the surface of Mars just like Earth's climate reshapes the surface of the Earth. And uh, it's just really neat to see that um, in action. Yeah. Um, and so this one comes from Guido Bibra. Will space play a role in the 2016 U.S. election, and actually, you wrote this story, Morgan, so... I did so, write this story. So, so what do you, what, give us the synopsis. Will space play a role in the 2016 election? Probably not. Uh, okay. So I wrote this story because uh, last week we got our first uh, high-profile uh, contender in the U.S. Uh, presidential election of 2016, which uh, as of now I think is 580 days away. So you'd think we wouldn't be talking about this yet, but... Um, Sadly, that's not the case. Uh, so uh, Senator Ted Cruz from Texas became the first uh, major player to announce that he's running uh, to be president. And uh, that was noteworthy because he is now chair of the subcommittee in the Senate that controls the budget of NASA, uh, amongst other things. And so he has sort of a public profile in, in the space uh, community. Uh, he's not the only, uh, the only person... Um, like that, uh, and many of the people, of the candidates that people are talking about for um, uh, possible presidential nomination come from space-heavy states, states like Texas and Florida, uh, where we've had a lot of, of talk recently about candidates uh, like um, Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio, uh, Ted Cruz, of course. Uh, and so I asked the question, well, 
because we have these people coming from space uh, heavy states, could space exploration uh, play a role as a talking point in, in the election? Uh, and to answer this, I went back and looked at some polling data from Pew Research, who asked Americans uh, back uh, at the beginning of the year to rank uh, the issues that they thought their government should be uh, working on and supporting from most important to least important. Uh, and of the 23 issues that they received enough responses about, scientific research placed 21st uh, out of 23. Uh, unsurprisingly, the top issues were things like terrorism, the economy, education, health care. Uh, people just don't have a lot of uh, desire to see uh, their politicians spend a lot of time talking about issues of scientific research uh, when there are perceived to be much larger problems out there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it won't entirely uh, escape. Uh, because NASA plays a big role in climate science research, uh, and that is something that's likely to come up, uh, if not during the primaries, certainly during the general election as a differentiator between candidates. What's your stance on both the existence of climate change and uh, how we should be responding to it? Uh, and NASA is one of the leaders in climate change research, and so they're likely to get dragged in uh, to that debate uh, when it inevitably comes up. Um. It's a it's a funny thing because you know a lot of people have really taken Ted Cruz to task for his very anti-science attitudes about climate change and even NASA's role in in climate science Earth observation. You know he made a lot of public statements that were just like stop looking at Earth, look out in space. Yeah, I remember that. And you know and that was really obnoxious, <laughs> but um and, but at the same time. Uh, he and sort of Congress really helped push through uh, some of the additional increased budgets to um, uh, to some of the planetary sciences, you know, NASA's budget for the last for the next couple of years. So we've we've had a bit of a reprieve from all of the budget slashing that went on, and in fact, the budgets were were boosted up. So yeah. it's it's been right now. I mean, as always, it is totally sort of fifty fifty about Sometimes. whether these people. Oh, go ahead, David. Sometimes. Sometimes, Frazier, early on in the primaries, like Morgan was saying, you'll hear them talk about space. I remember last election, it was uh, I think it was Newt Gingrich that said he wanted to turn the moon into the 51st state or something like that, alluding to building a moon colony. I think they do that more just to grab headlines and attention because then when you get down to two candidates and you get to the debate, space kind of goes in the background again. And like you said, yeah. they're going through Florida, which space means jobs there, so... It's, yeah. uh, and it's a state they campaign in profusely. Uh, there are other states like Maine that they never come to, but Florida, every candidate will come through there multiple times during elections. So. Yeah, and always people try to guess at my political affiliation, and I'm a Canadian, so you don't understand. <laughs> you, you wouldn't even recognize You're lucky. our political parties. You know, Don't blame me. I, I voted for Kodos is the way I describe it. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a fine line that a lot of uh, astronomers walk because the, the, the people... People who are most supportive of planetary science research tend to be the same people who are the least supportive of almost any other type of scientific research or scientific policy. And so, you know, we're placed sort of in the position of having to decide between sort of our livelihood and our ability to do the exciting work that we want to do versus what's probably best for the broadest swath of the nation. And I think that's why you won't hear a lot of... Uh, planetary scientists, a lot of astronomers really take strong stands. Uh, the planetary society is in the same way. They have to walk a fine line um, between uh, these these various sort of issues. Um, and, and that also helps, I think, keep it out of the public eye, is that the people who are most affected by it aren't willing to raise it up and make it a campaign issue because um, it, it might end up going the way that's better for us but worse for a lot of other people. So we've got to... Uh, Guido Bibra has built us a uh, has built a, a Bitly link for the WSH crew, so you can go to bit.ly/wshcrew, and it's all. Oh, wow, that's easy. Yeah, I don't know if that's it's. Pretty cool. It is case sensitive, so it has to be capital W, capital S, capital H, capital C, and then lowercase R E W. Might I suggest Guido that you also make one that's that's lowercase as well, and that way people can go either way. Um, uh, okay, cool. Great. Okay, so uh, Nancy said sure, so I will announce who's going to be coming next week. Um, 
So next week we've got Dr. Stephen Grenade, which is awesome. Uh, oh, cool. Stephen is the director of the science track at uh, at Dragon Con and a and a good friend. And uh, I I'm super excited that we're going to have him joining us next week. Uh, also a physicist. After that, we're going to have uh, Amy Shira Titel, who as a used to not be a special guest. Used to I know. Was she you know one time I, host uh, regular right week of hangout? I remember way back when, when Amy used to come on a regular basis, but she's now, here. yeah, she'll be back. I hear, uh, I, I, it's, I, hear, I hear she's got a book coming out. She, she does have a book coming. This is how we have. To, this is what it takes for us to be able to get these people to come back on the Weakest Piss Hangout. Is they got to have a book to promote, and uh, uh, and so Amy's got one. Uh, Amy does have one coming out. And she's also working for Discovery now, and uh, and living in Pasadena, I think, and you know, doing lots of local I, reporting. So. I, I, always know, busy. I always know when people vanish from the web, especially writers, that they're working on their book. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then after that, so this is going to be on April 24th, is we're going to have Bass Lansdorp from Mars One. So I really hope that Bass doesn't uh, look back at the uh, <laughs> pummeling that we've given Mars One. And uh, and I think we're going to have a really good chat with him about uh, enthusiasm for space and... and What's that? Don't let Pamela come that week. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll have Pamela take the week. No, no, I'm sure she'll. I'm sure we'll have a great conversation. Oh, it'll be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to talking to him. So, uh, so put that into your calendars, and then, uh, and once again, uh, this is done. Big thanks to the folks at the WSH crew. They are choosing the guests that they want to see. They are choosing the lineup. I am merely now just the uh, the person who talks to them. So. Um, well, hey, uh, thanks a lot, guys, for, for joining me this week. Uh, Dave, where do people find out more? Let's see, this week I was active on Universe Today, my own site, After Guys, Let's Store, and I've got an article on the Eclipse also over on Zen this week for coming up for the Eclipse. And yeah, you just started also, writing for for Zen, yeah, right? Actually, so, Charles uh, Black, who's been on the show a couple of times, I know he kind of reached Kind of by, by good happenstance, uh, meeting Charles Black here on the Weekly Space Hangout. That uh, I've got a few articles uh, up over there now too, so I've got a, another thing to put on my resume. So. That's fantastic. Yeah, and, and, uh, I, I also have another science fiction story coming out on my Amazon page right now, my author page too. It, it may be live right now. I was just working on it before I came on the Weekly Space Hangout. So and so, if people want to find your fiction and and give you money, can they buy right. your books from it, or are they? Yes, they can. Uh, you can go and get free chapters of my book, and it links over to my author page on Amazon. Uh, after Guys, I'm putting up a free chapter of my fiction every week. I'm kind of taking uh, the hint of that sounds familiar. Of just giving my stuff away, and hopefully somebody gives me a movie uh, deal. With that's, so, it's worked for Andy. It's, it's got to work model, for you. So. so I'm giving it away. So Perfect. It's over there on After Guys. All right, more... Morgan, now where do we find out more? Well, you can always find me uh, at on Twitter at Morgan Renberg. I get a kick out of interacting with all of you guys, but you can also check out my shiny new website, uh, MorganRenberg.com, uh, and I'd love to hear what you think about that. Um, I'm not the world's uh, premier web designer, so I'm interested to see what people think and see see if I can turn it into something uh, as cool as brands. That is awesome. Um, okay, cool. And of course, I'm. Fraser Kane, you can uh, find me here on Twitter, um, and you can also find my website here at Universe Today. Uh, if you're watching this right now, subscribe on this YouTube channel. I uh, really appreciate it. Join 43,000 other people who subscribe to this channel. Uh, we've got two really cool videos coming out every week. We just did one about how dense the asteroid belt is, and we did uh, how whether the universe is finite or infinite and what that means, and I promise you will have your mind completely blown when you watch that episode. So, uh, so and, this, and this is all done thanks to your support, and so uh, I'm always getting other people to talk about their Patreon campaigns, but I'll talk about mine. Go to patreon.com slash universe today, and you can support all the work that we're doing in space and astronomy. So, uh, Morgan, are you going to be talking to people in the space community? Have you got time for that uh, this week? If you or? tweet at me, I will answer to you, but I have meetings, Perfect. unfortunately, I have to run to this afternoon. Uh, so here's a great chance to uh, use the new Twitters, and uh, Perfect. be happy to answer so, questions. So send a tweet with a question to Morgan Renberg, and he will answer you. Done. Yes. All right.
Cool. Uh, well, hey, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, uh, David Morgan, for joining me this week, and we will see you all next week. Take care.